the last three weeks we've been thinking about the law. We've thought, talked about the Ten Commandments. Uh, we've talked about the Sabbath in particular, which is a thorny um, issue in and of itself. Uh, Gary, you had mentioned last week there are all those mm. other laws. Yeah. Um, and so I want to I want to think a little bit about that today because uh, this is a this is a common accusation that comes against Christians. So you just yep. pick and choose. So mm -hmm. it's fine for you to um, it's fine for you to wear uh, fabric of mixed cloth, but you choose to follow many of the sexual ethics. Uh, right. It's fine for you to eat bacon, but um, mm -hmm. but but suddenly you know you're you're picking and choosing it seems like and and so I've, I've heard that accusation on shows like the West Wing for example uh, right. which was almost 20 years ago uh, was on TV so I wanted to think a little bit about that today uh, do let me just straight up ask you do yeah. Christians pick and choose which laws they're going to obey and then I think Andrew even say intramurally there are Christians that have very um, sensitive consciences, and they, they want to uh, they want to honor God, and so they they read these things, and they even struggle just mm -hmm. interpreting it for themselves. You're right; it's definitely an apologetic against the church by people that are not Christians. But I'd say there are lots of people that struggle with it inside the church as well. And so I think um, we'll probably try to approach this one. You know, how does the Bible interpret itself? Uh, maybe, you know, remind ourselves of the purpose of the law. And then maybe where I'll start is just, if you recall two weeks ago, we talked about how the New Testament, Paul in particular, has probably at least five different kind of working uh, uses of the word law. Um, and I think I, we'll pick up off of that and just either remind or, or teach you that there are different kinds of laws in the Old Testament. And so usually theologians will categorize these as moral laws. That would be like the Ten Commandments. These are laws that arise out of God's character and uh, how he wishes to uh, develop, one, how we relate to him, and two, how we relate to others. So moral laws, they apply to everybody and both Old and New Testaments, without reservation. Uh, secondly, there would be ceremonial laws. Ceremonial laws are those laws that were enacted that shape the nation of Israel in particular and their worship of God. It set them apart as distinct. Uh, it was a way of, in a way, consecrating the nation unto God. And so we think of, for instance, we've gone through uh, every verse of the book of Leviticus, I think about three three or four years ago, right? And we saw then the institution of how does God dwell with man while well, he creates the mediating sacrificial sacrificial system, right? And, and there are ways in which then the nation was called to worship God. Those are ceremonial laws. Then thirdly, there are civil laws. Civil laws, and that's just how they would function uh, neighbor to neighbor in all the laws that have to uh, just guide and guard uh, good public flourishing. And so I think it's really important to distinguish between those three categories and then see how how does even, say, the New Testament deal with certain elements of those laws. And, you know, one I can think of, for instance, uh, you mentioned, you know, why do, why do we say it's fine to eat bacon? Uh, well, Jesus himself said it was fine to eat bacon. The Lord uh, gave permission. He, he said, to Peter, you know, don't call things that are uh, clean, unclean. And of course, that was, often these things are pointing to greater truths, all right? So it's not to say this wasn't a, an important law at some point, but right now, or, or in the New Covenant, we see pointing to a greater truth, and that is, of course, the grafting in of the new people into the people of God. And we now then as Paul would talk about breaking down the barriers between Jew and Gentile, and that, of course, is in Christ. And so just as laws are fulfilled in different ways uh, through Christ, uh, but they are fulfilled, I think some of these specific laws, we really have to see which category do they fall in. Um, and, and we have clear direction from the New Testament that we don't need to follow uh, things such as food laws. Yeah, now, I even... 
even the breakdown between moral, ceremonial, and civil. I know some people will. Uh, that is a, another whole debated yeah. area. Um, and as we think about the law, I think it's sometimes helpful to remember what the law was uh, was to do for Israel. Mm -hmm. Um, in Galatians, and before I, before I get to Galatians 3, let me just say that these aren't issues that can just be captured in a sound bite. And, and in, our, in our day where 280 characters on Twitter or a nice pithy little statement is what's often used to summarize uh, political philosophy, we, we run amok when we try and reduce God's glorious revelation down to a soundbite. Mm. Uh, Paul says in Galatians 3, uh, 23, Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, the we being Israel, the Jewish people, imprisoned until the coming of faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came. Now all of these verses are hotly debated in Christianity, but I think most basically, we could say, what was the law doing for Israel? God was preparing a people so that his promised son would come. And if we, if we divorce the Old Testament law, all of its commands, from the goal of God to bring about the snake crusher, the, the, the seed of the woman, the, the promised king and Messiah, if we divorce the law from that, we'll run into all sorts of issues. Yes, the law is good, as Paul will say in 1 mm -hmm. Timothy 1, if you use it lawfully. Um, but Paul goes on there to say that the law is given not for the just, but for the unjust. It's for those who are disobedient and insolent, who are rebellious. And, and so it, it's to drive us then to Christ. God had designed the Old Testament law so that there would be a holy people, a nation, a remnant, if you would, that would bring about a child of promise who would fulfill the law in all of its righteousness. Mm -hmm. So then, so then I, that does help us maybe, as, as debated as some of those categories, Gary, you mentioned, yeah, yeah. certainly it does help us. Let's, let's just take some of those uh, ceremonial laws. Yeah. How, how might Christ being this, this aim of the law help people to think about, what do mm -hmm. I do with all the sacrifices, for example, in Leviticus? Well, Maybe, you know, read the book of Hebrews, for one. It's <laughs> probably a great place to start if you want a biblical reference point. But I'll read just out of Hebrews 10, for instance. And so we, I don't know if you've been following along in the devotions I've mentioned this week, uh, just how um, a little bit about temple worship and how there was the holy place and the most holy place separated by this veil, right? And, and the most holy place, a lot of us know, um, common knowledge that the high priest was the only one allowed in there. He would only go in there once a year. And the writer of Hebrews uh, has this really interesting passage for us to read from uh, verse 19, I think it is. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus. So that granting believers the right to enter into the most holy of intimacies with Christ. That's a legal, if you will, a legal access that's granted to believers by the blood of Christ. And so here's an example of something that is fulfilled and, and I might say transformed. If you read the e-bulletin today, I talk about different ways in which uh, Old Testament promises are fulfilled. And sometimes they're just completed, like, for instance, uh, you know, all those prophecies about Jesus' birth, for instance, through Isaiah and Micah, you know, the great ruler of Israel that uh, Micah 5 mentions that would come out of Bethlehem, that's a completed promise. But then there are all other promises that are transformed. And I think this would be one of those where you see a transformation and an extension. And so there is there's still a, a, a profound holiness and an, a, an exclusionary holiness, if you will, of access to God's intimacies. But we have that now extended. It's not merely through a mediating high priest. We have a new high priest, the perfect high priest, and that is Christ, who by his blood 
allows us access. There's that beautiful passage where we are even able to go into the very throne of grace to find grace and mercy to help in time of need because that veil, top to bottom, was torn the moment Jesus yielded up his spirit. Um, and so that's an example, I think, Andrew, how you know the Bible can give us a clear conscience that there are ways in which Jesus transforms these Old Testament promises and laws. Mm -hmm. Paul, Paul says something interesting in Romans 10, 4, when he's talking about that, that his desire is for the Roman church that, and, and ultimately for the Jewish people that they would be saved, but it's not based on works, uh, by mm -hmm. obedience to the law that they would be saved. But he, he makes an interesting comment. He says that Christ is the end of the law. Now, mm -hmm. many people then get confused about what does that word end, end. mean. It can mean the goal. So right. in one sense, the purpose of the law, a lot of these commands, is to show us that Jesus is the one who was the promised one who is who is to come. Uh, so he is the sacrificial system. He is the high priest. He is the one who all of those ceremonial commands point to. It also can mean that he's the, the goal or the fulfillment of the law in that the goal is that when you fall into sin, that it would drive you to Christ so that you would turn to Christ and that you would know that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. But then there is also an element in terms of fulfillment mm -hmm. where um, it's, it's, as you were talking about, Gary, there's holiness of life. So I think about how there are some commands that, that don't make a lot of sense to us, like, don't muzzle the ox while he's treading out the grain. And Paul picks that up in 1 Timothy 5, right. where he says, let the elders who work among you be worthy of their uh, of, uh, the fruit of their labor. Uh, and he, he then quotes the scripture where it says, uh, you shall not muzzle an ox when mm -hmm. it treads out the grain. And from there, he's, he's directly quoting from the Old Testament. He's, he's pulling up Deuteronomy 25, verse 4. But then Jesus also has interpreted that as, and he quote, Paul quotes Jesus by saying, the laborer deserves his wages. Mm -hmm. So, so as a, an ox is working in the field, you don't muzzle the ox because a, a, an ox deserves to eat because of its work. And in the same way, so there's a, a correlation, if you would, uh, in the same way, uh, a, way, a laborer in the gospel is worthy of his wages. And so there's this ongoing relevance for holy life, for justice, as you mentioned, rooted in the character of God, a, a just God, a generous God, and a faithful God. And so, so there's continued ongoing relevance. Uh, Gary, if someone was looking at some of these Old Testament laws, and they wondered, well, how do I decide if it's still relevant today? So, okay, I get the Christ interpretation. I can kind of figure out the sacrificial system. But what about what about some of these more obscure laws? Can can we maybe help people to know how do I handle those those laws? Yeah, I, I think for one, it does come down ultimately to knowing your New Testament really well. I think allowing scripture to interpret scripture. So for instance, we talk sort of the exercise we went through on the Sabbath is is a good one just as a template because when you have um, the, the exhortation, I guess, of Christ to say that God made Sabbath for man, not man for Sabbath, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so then that does reorient the Sabbath completely, completely reorients it. And so how we are charged with seeing that all the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ, and so that forces us as Christians to be biblically faithful means to biblically, or it means to look at things through a Christ-centered lens, and so I think that's where you start with. You have to, you have to just know Christ, and you have to know Scripture. Uh, these are very nuanced things, and I think both of us would admit there are there would be instances where there are things where, hey, you know, I don't know that I've thought through that quite enough myself, and mm -hmm. you know, we've studied many years uh, the Word of God, you know, professionally, if you will. So it is a challenge, but I think if you, um, one, God wants, um, he will work with you by his spirit. 
uh, these laws are fulfilled uh, in faith and love both and so just I, I would say whatever you do do of faith which is again a new, great yeah. New Testament command and and do it with a, a clear conscience and so if you can't um, if you can't do this by faith, then I would say that's that's an evidence of, of a transgression, all right. And but then again, you know, if the light that's in you is darkness, how great is the darkness, right? So we don't just rely on our consciences; we really have to root ourselves in the Word of God. That's why, as a church, we say that uh, that's our number one value, and and our five values is to be biblical. We want everything, our, we want our whole lives, to be seen through the lens. And the authority of Scripture and Scripture alone. And as a final word here, I'll to to go back, Gary, to what you said. If we remember the character of God, um, Micah six eight comes to mind. Uh, he showed you, O oh man, what is good. What does the Lord require of you? Mm. To do justly. The law is to. Uh, it is intended not only to point us to Christ, not only to find our our, our forgiveness in Christ, but it's also to shape us so that we would know what is right and wrong, mm -hmm. that we would we would live as just people. Pierre Trudeau talked about the just society, and yeah. and we we do want property markers to be properly placed, and we want scales to be rightly uh, measured. I want to know that when I go to the gas pump, that when it says that I've put in 22.8 liters, that it's 22.8 mm -hmm. liters. Mm -hmm. uh, the law is showing the generosity. Don't don't uh, harvest right up to the edges of your fields. But in other words, there are principles of God's very character. And, and when we see those laws that we're uncertain about, we remember there's a there's atonement, and there's forgiveness, there's retro, uh, restoration for lost property, there's justice, and so mm -hmm. we we. There's so much more we could talk about here. One thing maybe, too, I just thought of, Andrew, is let's remind ourselves of the very words of Christ. And, and he, he boiled down the 613 to 2. And so if, that is our, that's right. is that a, if that's our objective to say, what does loving God look like in this moment? Like you've got a specific ethical question. What does loving God look like in this moment? What does loving my neighbor look like in this moment? You are going to cover, I think, all the bases there. If, if you really are truly seeking seeking the Lord. And what's evident, we haven't covered these kinds of scriptures, but that fulfilling of the law is a work of the Spirit. That's right. And so if you walk by the Spirit, as Paul said, you'll not fulfill the lustful desires of the flesh. And those lustful desires aren't simply what kind of magazines are you looking at. It's those those covetous desires. It's it's how you treat your neighbor. And so again, love God, love your neighbor, empowered by the Holy Spirit. I I have every confidence that God will lead you. <laughs> and obedience is not always, often it is black and white, but it's often very challenging um, because we as humans have made things challenging by our own sin, but we have been given the Spirit. And as I love to quote Galatians 5, I'll end today, the mm. fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, mm -hmm. faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. When we walk in those things, as we walk in the Spirit, as Paul talks about in Galatians 5, against such things, there is, there no, is law. no law. <laughs> so you can go beyond the righteous requirements of the law in the Spirit by loving God and loving neighbor. Yeah, if you've got more questions, drop us an email. We'd love to uh, respond to that. But thanks for tuning in to Table Talk, and Lord willing, we'll see you on Sunday. Amen. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye.